completing a Stuart triple expansion engine part 39, removing the slide valve guides from the intermediate cylinder port face and fitting the high pressure cylinder. Just about everything that you're about to see in this episode ended up being quite a fiddly job. This part was easy, I just removed the bolts holding the brass parts to the cylinder port face. Originally when I machined this brass angle, I did it in such a way that it could be held to the port face by using just two bolts. But now that the brass angle has done its job and allowed me to set the position of the slide valve, it's time to remove every one of the securing bolts. Using a felt tip pen, I mark the position on the screw thread where the valve needs to be. With a bit of luck, this should give me some idea where to position the valve once it's all back together. In this clip, I'm showing that the valve fork is still attached to the expansion link via the die block. This assembly needs to be dismantled, and that's no sooner said than done. Here's the expansion link without the die block and the valve fork in place. In case you're wondering what the cable tie is for, it was originally used to hold the connecting rod in an upright position so it didn't catch when I was rotating the engine. When I was originally testing the engine, the two connecting rods that you see here were fastened to the crossheads. The cable tie was only used on the connecting rod that would normally be fastened to the crosshead of the high pressure cylinder, but as that wasn't in place, that's why I used the cable tie. This complicated part is the high pressure steam chest and the high pressure cylinder. Additionally though, the intermediate steam chest is all part of the same casting. And here I've fitted the valve rod and the driver block. In this clip you can see that I'm using a large screwdriver positioned in the valve fork to allow me to rotate the valve spindle as I screw it into the driving block because the gland is quite tight. Before setting the drive block in the correct position, I'm applying a lot of oil. Because if you remember the marks that are made on the actual valve spindle showed that the drive block was quite close to the bottom of the spindle. Now I would say it's in about the right position. And it's a good time to chop the cable tie and remove it. Now the job starts to get slightly fiddly. I may make a new one of these, but for the moment I'm inserting the old gasket between the high pressure cylinder casting and the main casting. The gasket isn't really old, it's one that I made in a previous episode. Eventually I got it to sit in the right place between the parts and here I'm fitting the bolts that hold it all together. Well at least that's what I'm trying to do. In the end I used my scriber to align the holes and once I'd done that it was fairly plain sailing. I decided to use Allen cap head bolts just to make them easier to fit. Originally I used a ball ended Allen key but I never used this type of Allen key for tightening the Allen bolts because a couple of times in the past I've had the ball end of one of these Allen keys snap off in the bolt and that is not something I want to happen in this case. And that is why I'm using a modified shortened Allen key to tighten these bolts that hold the castings together. From assembly I'm now going to disassembly. I'm using the fancy nuts on top of the standards that hold the main casting in place. These nuts are stainless steel ones and they're called acorn nuts. I don't know why really, because they don't look anything like acorns, but anyway, that's what they're called. They can look quite good in applications like this, I think. The reason for fully assembling the cylinder blocks was to make sure that the position of every one of the drop arms was where they needed to be to engage with the expansion links. And guess what? One of them wasn't. Once again, this is a quick fix using my Proxon blowtorch, which is very small and very useful. All I had to do was warm up the offending drop arm, remove it from the shaft, clean up both the drop arm and the shaft, and reposition the arm in the correct place. And this is like a deja vu, but at least this time the arm will be in the correct place. I really couldn't get the accurate position for it until the cylinder block was fully assembled. Now when I look at this image, I can see that it looks a lot better, because now the reversing shaft sticks out about the same at both ends. Now I can remove the entire cylinder block as one unit, and once that is safely on the bench, I can turn the engine round the other way, and lift the reversing shaft, complete with its bearings, off the top of the standards. 
The next episode will be a little bit nerve-wracking, although I don't know why, because if I mess it up, it's an easy fix. I'm going to drill through every one of the drop arms, going all the way through the shaft, then using a taper reamer. I will end up with four tapered holes all the way through the components, into which I can insert some taper pins. That will take place in the next episode, because it ended up being slightly more complex than I thought it was going to be. So that's it for this one. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.